right. Uh, good morning. I want to thank you all for showing up for our life skills class on basic auto maintenance. Um, we're not really going to cover any fixing of anything today, just uh, the things that you should, if you have a vehicle, that you should be looking at and checking on a regular basis. Uh, basically, the idea here is uh, minor maintenance things that can make you do two things. It will help your car last longer. It'll survive. It'll it'll make its full lifespan, being a functional vehicle, getting you from here to there in one piece. The other part is is if you're doing these kind of regular maintenance checks, um, you get used to seeing what the car looks like and what things look like when everything is good. So that way, when something is out of line or something is not right. Uh, it's kind of alerting you to problems that can be coming up before they become a crisis. So I'm going to walk you through a bunch of stuff today. Um, not really going to dive too deeply into um, the, the nuts and bolts, if you will, of how the car works. Just enough to kind of get you an idea of why some of this stuff is important. Okay? Um, anyway. All right. Uh, in addition to the stuff that's listed down here that we're going to talk about specific items, when you do a visual inspection on your car, which you should do on a regular basis, I'd say maybe about once a week, walk around the car and look. Look underneath. You want to look for things like wires and cables and stuff that are hanging down that aren't usually there. You want to look for puddles of fluid underneath the car that are not usually there. Water, oil, other fluids. That's going to give you an idea that something's not right. Something's wrong there and you need to uh, either get it to somebody that can fix it or if you can figure out what's going on, deal with it yourself. Okay? All right, we're going to start by talking about oil. And I'm starting with oil because oil literally is the lifeblood of your engine. Losing the oil in your engine will be the first thing to kill it deader than dead. Um, oil is used to keep all those metal parts in there that are rubbing against each other, keep it lubricated. There's oil pumping under pressure through all these passages inside the engine and in between those metal parts. And then it drains back into the pan, gets picked up by the pump and circulated again. So you wanna make sure that you've got a good level of oil in there so that the circulation uh, allows there to be enough oil in the system to keep your engine lubricated. If you run low or you run out, that's a problem, okay? There are different types of oil. There's uh, conventional oil, which is what we've been using in engines for 100 years or more. Um, in the last 20 years or so, synthetic oils have become much more popular. Um, the good thing about synthetics is they do last a lot longer than conventional oil. Um, some engines, including my Subaru out here, are specifically designed to um, operate only on synthetic oils. So if you have one of those vehicles in the owner's manual, it will tell you you only put a synthetic oil. And that's because that oil is formulated to, um, to work well with all the rubber seals and other things, gaskets that are inside the engine. And if it does say synthetic only, then you make sure you run with synthetic only. The other good thing about synthetics is they don't break down as quickly as other oils. With a regular oil, you usually want to do an oil change about every 5,000 miles or so. Uh, synthetics can go as long as 15,000. Uh, most of the time they, uh, they recommend about 7,500. So they last longer, which doesn't necessarily translate to saving money because they also cost more. Uh, a quart of conventional oil uh, at AutoZone or someplace like that will probably cost you five or six bucks a quart. By the cheaper stuff, it's even less than that. A uh, quart of synthetic is typically gonna be around 11 or 12. So it's more expensive, but it lasts longer. And in some cases it's required, like with my car. Uh, the other important piece about oil is the viscosity. That's the number that's on the bottle. You'll see it, it'll say something like 10W30 or 5W20. That is a measure of how thick the oil is when it's in your engine. The first number is how thick it is when it's cold. You want, the, you want your oil to be thick enough that it's gonna lubricate 
but you don't want it to get real thin when it gets hot. So that's why they have what's called multi-vis oil. It heads thicker when it's cold, thins out when it gets hot, and it works better in your engine that way, okay? And as far as what type you wanna use in your car, go back to your owner's manual. Um, sometimes on the oil fill cap under the hood, you'll see it on mine outside, it will actually tell you what weight to put in the, in the car. So, okay, all right. Uh, second item on the list is transmission fluid. If you have an automatic transmission, it's got a special type of oil in it that helps the transmission do all of its work, shifting gears, and also transmitting that in, that the energy from the engine to the rear wheels, or all four wheels in some cases, to make the car move forward. So you need to check that and make sure it stays topped up also. You don't have to change your transmission fluid. Some shops will try to get you to do that. It's rarely a good idea to, to flush that out, okay? You don't change it? Don't. No. Most of the time you don't. Go back to your owner's manual. If you're not sure about the owner's manual, call the dealer, uh, look on their website or something. A lot of times, a lot of shops will try to sell you on that idea of a transmission flush. Um, I, every, everything I've ever read or heard about those, that they're not really necessary and in some cases not a good idea. So change your, you can, Drop the pan on your transmission, drain the fluid out, replace the filter, and top it off. Uh, it's not really a, a super required maintenance. It's not like changing your oil yeah. in the engine. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, next item down there, belts and hoses. Look underneath the hood, you're gonna see a lot of belts, or sometimes just the one big serpentine belt. Uh, also hoses. You wanna visually inspect those and look at them and make sure that they're not getting worn. Um, I actually have an old hose out and an old belt in my car that I can show you what it looks like when it does get worn. Uh, hoses will get a little soft and spongy instead of a nice hard rubber. When they get soft and spongy, they're weaker and they're more likely to blow out. Uh, with belts, you'll get cracking or you'll sometimes see the, the, the fibers on the inside, the reinforcement will start fraying. When you see those happening, it's time to change them and replace them. Uh, some cars, will, the owner's manual will tell you to plan on replacing belts and hoses at a certain point. Uh, I just did everything on my car at 185,000, so. It, oh, it, wow, really? Oh, yeah. On your Subaru? Yeah, she went a long time. Damn. Uh, I blew one radiator hose just before Christmas, so I went ahead and replaced both of them, and I did the big belt at the same time. So, anyway, on the back, coolant. Sometimes we call it antifreeze because uh, it does both jobs. When it's hot, it helps keep your engine cool. When it's cold and freezing outside, it helps to keep that water in there from freezing. Uh, freezing up inside an engine can do anything from uh, bursting your hoses to cracking the head or the block, uh, blowing out freeze plugs. So you don't want the water in your engine block to freeze. So we use a, we use a, a chemical called ethylene glycol, and that's, run, that's what runs in your radiator and runs through the engine to keep it cool. You do want to make sure that the level stays at a good place on that, um, and I'll show you how to check that when we're outside. That's a problem I just had with my car. Yeah. My, uh, I was driving on the freeway and it said like my car was overheating or something. Yeah. And I said, like, my whole dashboard started flashing red. Yeah. I yeah. swear, and it told me to pull over, and I pulled over, and um, I called my dad, and he said, you need coolant. Yep. <laughs> Computer control systems on modern cars, they're <laughs> sensors that are monitoring everything, and sometimes when certain things uh, aren't, doing what they're supposed to do under the hood mm -hmm. the computer control system will just send you 27 different warnings about anything and everything i had an issue with my transmission yeah, I, I was playing playstation or something just, just, yeah like i old. was i had a issue you with my transmission a couple of years ago <laughs> and uh it, it ended up having to need a transmission repair but the uh the warning lights were telling me all kinds of stuff that had nothing to do with the transmission. Right. My cruise control quit working, which I never could figure out why that's connected, but anyway, yeah. Getting that stuff fixed is important. Yeah, I um, think cool in my trunk now. But yeah, exactly, <laughs> you'll see that out there too. Uh, next item there is brake fluid. Um, 
Brake fluid is, again, it's a special type of oil. It's a hydraulic fluid. When you step on the brake pedal in your car, it pushes a cylinder, a piston through a cylinder, and that cylinder sends fluid out to all four wheels under pressure. That squeezes the pads against the disc in your car. That's what slows you down to stop. Very important function of a car being able to stop. You don't Is that why not... the rest happens on the brakes or not? What's that? Is that why there's rest? Like on the uh, brake no, there's you get rust on your brake pad or your brake your disc because they get wet. They're kind of exposed oh, just and they're hot. Yeah, and they're and they're hot because um, you rub, you know, when you rub two items together at a high speed, you get mm -hmm. friction. They get hot. They get a little bit of water on them, especially after, after just before you stop, and then they get water there. It's hot. It's uh, going to rust. It's normal. It rubs right off. It's not sure. So if you have a brake sign on, is that danger? You have a brake light on, on your, on your, like on the dash. Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> on and off. <laughs> um, it can be. It depends on why it's on. Um, like I said, there's a lot of car. Well, it can be like a short cars have a lot of sensors under the hood. Yeah, if it's, mine throws a lot of. Uh, codes at me too. <laughs> <laughs> God. All right. So and if you're if you're getting those check it. engine kind of lights, you can take your car to most auto parts places like AutoZone or O'Reilly or uh, Craig and they have code readers. OBD. OBD readers, right? So basically, you can borrow the reader, take it out to your car, and plug it in. And usually, the process is you plug the reader into the car, turn the car on let the reader read whatever it is the computer's telling it, and it's just gonna give you a series of number codes, basically. And you'll wanna write those codes down and remember them, and then you get to go online and find the codes for your particular car, and it'll tell you. It sometimes will tell you what's wrong with your car. Yeah, they'll give you a sheet too. Like yeah, or they'll give you a sheet, yeah. yeah. And But the it's, it's not that black and white or cut and dry, really, because sometimes the code will tell you something that isn't really the issue, but it will take you in that direction. Um, I've had, you know, I've had, I've done that with a reader yeah. and gotten a code that said, you know, that my brake fluid was low. Mm. Well, I've got brake fluid in there. I'm not <laughs> sure why it's doing that. And my problem has nothing to do with brakes. My problem has to do with transmission, but got me going in that direction. But anyway, yeah. um, we'll show you, I'll show you how to check brake fluid when we're outside. Brake fluid's not one you want to jump on topping off all the time because as your brake pads wear down, they're going further in and more of the fluid is inside the system, not in the reservoir. And when you when those pads get worn to the point they have to be replaced you push the piston back out and all that fluid comes back into the reservoir so i've i've done brake jobs before where i took the cap off of the reservoir when i compress the piston back i've got fluid flowing out of the reservoir on the ground but at the same time you do want to check every now and then because if you see a lot of fluid going down that might mean you've got a leak in a brake line somewhere sure how many times have you caused more damage to your car trying to fix something <laughs> that's a great wait, question wait, trying to fix something <laughs> like trying to fix something that you know because personally bro my homie owns an auto mechanic shop in my yep. hometown and then my other homie owns an auto mechanic shop on yep. flowers so like with all my issues bro i'm hitting them and i'm hitting that <laughs> i'm with you, you know? but look at i can guarantee bro <laughs> i have so many of my friends like bro you know I'm gonna save money, $300, $300 and 20 trips to AutoZone later, you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly, and we're exactly. we're taking it to my homie shop anyways, cause now it's fucked. Bingo. It's not working. Um, my, my grandfather was a professional mechanic. Oh, so you've got it. I learned, yeah, I learned a lot good, from so him. Good. And um, the two most important things that I learned from him, number one is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> So yeah, if it's if it's something that's that's screen. working, leave it alone because if you mess with it, it might stop working. <laughs> and the second thing is, if you're not sure what you're doing, find you somebody find somebody who does. Yeah, I sure. will say that if you if, if you have I some mean, if you have some basic mechanical skills, you know how to work tools, 
you know what pieces are. When you look underneath the hood, you look at some component of the engine and you know what that is. You're not looking at it going, I have no idea what this does. See, I'm going to look at that component and then I'm going to hear the word <laughs> and then I'm going to forget about everything. <laughs> right, you know, right. Auto you know, mechanics bro, is I'm not for you. Exactly. Know, like, <laughs> the bar, bro, like, but if you do have some basic mechanical skills, YouTube is your friend. Because I've I've learned every every car is a little bit unfinished projects everywhere. Exactly, every car is a little bit different, and fixing something on this car and fixing exactly the same thing on a different car could be a very very different process. Uh, and that's why, like I said, I've I've gone back to YouTube to figure out how to do things, and usually you can find somebody who's done what you're trying to do and filmed it and posted it and you can walk through the process that way, okay? All right, uh, next one is air filters. Uh, you should change your air filter at the same time you do your oil change. We're actually gonna do an oil air filter change on my car out there because I'm due for both of them. Uh, that's yeah. probably one of the easiest yeah. things to do is an air filter change. Uh, you may also, depending on your car and how old it is, you may have a cabin filter which is not really is that good. Under the... That's underneath the dash. Okay. Doesn't really have anything to do with how the engine runs. What it's doing is it's filtering air that's coming into the car from outside. Uh, if you have an al issue with allergies or if you have or a kid that has, exactly, or Bakersfield in general, if you swap that filter out, it may help a little bit. I, I don't change mine that often because I rarely run my car with outside air coming in through the vent. I usually keep mine on recirculate just because I'm weird. But anyway, um, and then last but not least, tires. We're gonna look at tires very closely. Tires are your car's interaction with the road. And so they re you really need to pay attention to the condition of your tires. And looking at the surface of your tires, looking at the tread can tell you a lot about what's going on with your suspension and alignment, all of which are crucial to your car being steady and stable on the road. Uh, if you're looking at tires that are worn unevenly, that could be an alignment issue. If you see bumps and dips in the tire, that could be a balance issue on the wheel itself. Uh, it could also lead to, you could also have underinflation or overinflation. That's going to that's gonna show a specific type of wear on the tire. And I'll, we'll look at some of that when we get outside. Uh, keeping your tires inflated to the correct pressure is very important. If your tires run too low on air, they're not as solid and stable on the road. They're gonna run hotter than usual, which can damage the structure of the tire. Uh, if you're running low air in your tires, the surface of the tread will tend to dome up like this. So it'll wear a lot heavier on the outside edge than it will down the middle of the tread. If you're over inflated, it'll do just the opposite. It's gonna be a hard, stiff ride because there's not much bounce in that tire and it's gonna wear the middle part of the tread a lot faster. So having it at the right level. And if you look, if you go look in your owner's manual or if there's a, usually a sticker on the inside of the driver's door that will tell you what the correct pressure for your car. Isn't it on the tire? It'll tell you it, the tire. It's, the, sometimes it's on the tire that that's going to be specific to that tire. The manufacturer of the car might give you a different number. It's usually not going to be a whole lot of variance. See, that's why I don't like that. That's exactly. Kind of sneaky. It's you sneaky, exactly. Generally speaking, I'm doing on my yeah, generally speaking, almost always for passenger cars, it's going to be 32 to 35 PSI. So if you're in that 32 to 35 range, you're going to be good. Uh, most cars will have, uh, most modern cars will have a pressure sensor in the tire. And if you have a tire that goes below a certain point, a light will come on the dash and tell you that you need to check your air. Uh, I've got that on my car, but mine's not that great. It doesn't tell me which wheel. Mm -hmm. It just says, hey, you're low. And so then I gotta go figure out where to put air in. Uh, my son's Jeep has, um, actually has a specific sensor for each tire. So his dash, if he wants to look at air pressure, he hits a couple of buttons and it'll come up and tell him his left front is at 34, his right front's at 32, work his way around and you know, but I don't drive a fancy Jeep, I got an old Subaru. All right, any questions before we move outside? No, let's go. <laughs>
I'm glad to hear people being eager. One thing I'm going to recommend, one thing I'd recommend is go to a, a parts store and pick yourself up a pair of mechanics gloves and keep them in the back of your car. If you're doing this, either whether it's a regular weekly maintenance check or changing a tire, it's going to help you keep your hands clean and a little bit more protected. So uh, I'm going to blow up here and get going. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is check the oil. All right. Um, here under the hood, you're probably going to find, uh, most of the times I've been seeing them, they're yellow. It's a little round stick like this. You okay? Okay. Um, you want to make sure the engine's off. You want to check your oil while your engine's not running, okay? Pull the stick out. Wipe it down so it's nice and clean. All the way back in, all the way down. Pull it back out again, and you can look right here. You see where the oil level is, right? Yeah, it right here. Right there, okay. And on that stick, when there's nothing there, you see the two little dots? Yeah. See the two dots right there and there? You Ideally, you want the oil level to be between those two dots. If it's below the bottom one, you definitely need to add something. If it's above, you don't want it above too much, but if it's a little bit above, it's not a problem. It'll still run. Okay? Make sure you put it back. All right? um, adding oil, usually you'll find a cap on the somewhere near the top of the engine. Mine happens to be right here. And um, it will screw off most cases. And you'll also see right there at the top, it'll say 0W20. That's telling me what weight of oil to put in right there. Okay? Uh, make sure when you do this, you put it back. If you leave your oil cap off, like I've done a couple of times, uh, when the engine's running, it is creating a lot of internal pressure, and so it'll blow oil out through there, all over the inside of your engine. You'll think you're losing oil, and yeah, not a good thing. All right? That's engine oil. Any questions about that? No. All right. Now, uh, I have an automatic transition transmission on this car, but it's an odd type, and there is no way to check the transmission fluid level. On most cars, that dipstick will look just like this. It'll probably be a different color, and it'll say ATF on it or something like that. It's typically going to be back in this area of the engine here. So you want to check that with the car running. That's the big difference. This one you check with the engine off. That one you check with the engine running, put it in neutral, pull it out, test it, look at it the same way you did that stick. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Is there a reason? why the second one has to be when the car is running? Yes, because that's one that when the engine's running, that fluid is pumping through the transmission and it's doing a lot of the work of the transmission. And so you're making sure that there's sufficient fluid in the transmission for it to do what it needs to do. So and then when you shut it off, it all flows down into the pan, but not so much so as with the engine. So it's like, um, when it's off, it's just sitting like at the bottom it's of the lake. It's like sitting in a bucket, not being yeah. used. Exactly. But once you turn it on, exactly. like Willy Wonka goes it up to the straw. Exactly. And like you just stick it and you're like, oh, there's Bingo. water there. So That's it. Okay, so transmission fluid, we're done there. We're going to look at belts and hoses. Okay, so the most, if you want to come in and look really close, most of the hoses you're going to be concerned with your radiator hose. Top hose, bottom hose is down there. And if you want to come squeeze this, you can feel it's a nice, hard, solid rubber. That's a brand new hose. That's what you want them to feel like. Okay? Is this? this is the top radiator hose, bottom radiator hose down there. This Those is the both top? are connected. Yeah, this is the top. Where's the bottom? Bottom, same big, thick one down there. Oh, down there. Okay. Yeah, okay. And, and now, if they start to feel soft and spongy, mm -hmm. that's a sign that they're old, they're, they're breaking down. You probably want to change it before it decides to explode on you at some point. Okay? Now this car has only one belt. It's called a serpentine because it basically just goes up and down all the round. The belt drives everything from the AC compressor to power steering pump. It drives the alternator, which I can't remember. Oh, the alternator's right here. It drives a couple of other, um, the water pump down here to keep it cool. So you wanna make sure that belt is also nice and solid. If you're looking at the belt, um, if you see little fibers like threads on the side, that's a sign of wear. 
If you see cracks in the belt, that's a sign of wear. I've got an old one in the back. I can show you what some of those look like. Um, and these belts, the nice thing about the serpentines is they're actually fairly easy to change. You put a, put a big wrench on this one right here on the tensioner. You take the tensioner and you pull it this way and it takes all the tension off the belt. The belt slides off. You tension it back down again, slide the new belt on, it's done. Um, the downside to that is if that belt breaks, everything else under the hood stops working because it's not turning anymore. So you want to keep an eye on those. All right, questions about belts and hoses? No? All right, moving on. Coolant, radiator fluid. Don't ever open this when it's hot because the hot water in there is under a lot of pressure. And as soon as you turn that, it takes a, it, it, it'll blow off. You're going to get scalded really badly. So if your car is overheating and you need to check the water level in the radiator, park it, shut it off, give it some time to cool down, probably about half an hour, throw a nice big rag on top of here because you still don't want to catch any residual pressure, and put weight on it as you turn, let the pressure off a little bit, and then pull the cap off. As long as you can see water you'll in there. You'll hear a hiss too, right? Like you'll hear a hiss. Hit, hiss by hiss. Yeah. You'll hear a hiss. And just take a look down inside there. You can see where there's, where there's water in the radiator, so you don't need to add any. Um, if you have antifreeze or, or coolant, you want to use a 50-50 mix. 50% water, 50% coolant. You can actually buy it that way, already pre-mixed. I buy a full jug of the concentrate and then save an empty jug and mix it myself. But I carry a jug in the back just because. Uh, the overflow 50, 50. reservoir for your radiator, which there is this one right here. There you go. That's thank 50, you, Matt. 50, thank yeah. you. Thank yeah. you. The overflow reservoir for the radiator, if your car overheats a little bit, the pressure valve in the cap will open up and it will dump that overflow into here. Then later on when you shut the car off and the engine cools down, the suction will pull that water back in so you're not going to lose it all. You, can, you want to keep this about half full most of the time. Um, it, 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 adding water to this is not going to automatically put water in here. So if you need water in the radiator, pull the cap off, pour it in there. You don't want to overfill it. You want to leave a little bit of head space for it. There you stand. Okay. Uh, brake fluid is this one right here. Um, and if you have a stick shift with a clutch, there'll be two of these. There'll be this one and then a smaller one right next to it. One is your brakes. The other one is the clutch. If you pull, if you take the cap off, you can look inside there and see the level. Like I said, you don't normally want to add a lot to that. I actually just did a brake job on this car, so it's pretty full right now. All right. Mm. What's this? That is uh, power steering fluid. That's one I forgot to check. Power steering fluid, which is what runs that's the power important. steering. What's that? <laughs> that's, that's important. No, it's important. Sure. The power steering yeah. fluid goes out. You'll hear it when oh you turn your God. steering wheel. Your steering will scream. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, Matthew, in the back of my car, where the back's open, there is a, a box with an air filter in it. Can you bring me that, please? Thank you. Okay, air filter, we're actually gonna change it. Air filter, you can look, you can identify, it's usually a big box like this. You'll see an air hose that goes to the manifold or some, to somewhere to the top of the engine. They're usually pretty easy to access. Um, I've seen them with screws. Sometimes it's a lid that goes on top. Mine is really nice. It's just a couple of little spring clamps and then it pops off. You pull the whole thing up. That's the old filter coming out and you can see it's been a while. Hey, at least it protected you. Hey, this is true. Mm -hmm. uh, and one thing you want to do is pay attention to how the filter was in there. So you know, I know that the, the white part of the filter goes to the front of the box. Slide that in there. Get the bottom to line up where it belongs. Latch your back down. Yeah. Piece of cake. All right? Anything else? Any questions there? What's this? What's that? That's the top of my um, right front shock absorber. <laughs> it makes, it makes the car do this. Oh. <laughs> okay. All right, let's take a look at tires real quick. Steph, I want to step around over here on this side. Okay, and I'm kind of glad that I've got this going on because I can show you. If you look at this tire very carefully, you can see on the outside edge, it's wearing into the tread a little bit more than directly in the middle of the tread, which is telling me that I've got a little bit of an alignment issue. This wheel is probably not perfectly straight up and down. 
So I'm actually have an appointment to get my front end, front alignment done here soon. Um, if you see like little cups <clears throat> on the wear on the outside edge or the inside edge, that's probably a balance issue on your tire. You need to get it into a tire shop and have it rebalanced. Um, if again, like I said inside, if it's wearing down the middle, you've probably got too much air in your tires. If it's wearing more on both sides, you don't, you have not enough. Okay. Uh, I do want to show you how to check the pressure in your tires real quick. And. Along with your mechanics gloves, you should have a tire gauge somewhere in your car that you can get to pretty quickly. Uh, I like this type of the dial. It's a little more accurate. It's a little more rugged. You can get the, it's called a pencil gauge. It's a long piece, about yay long metal. Usually looks with kind a of little, like, ball, at little ball at the end. Pop that on the valve stem and it'll shoot out a stick and tell you your pressure. Like I said, I like the I dial gauge better. Question. Well, after yep. driving it, how yep. long should you give your car to cool down before you actually work on it in any car? Um, because I know it will retain heat maybe yeah. even 30 minutes. It depends on what you're doing, really. Like I said, if you're going to open the radiator, give it at least a half an hour. Let some of that pressure bleed off. Okay. Uh, if you're going to dive into engine work like uh, spark plugs or something like that, I'd let it sit overnight even. Uh, I did a brake job on this one. I had to drive it a little bit, but the wheels heat up. I let it sit for about an hour or so. That's good. Okay. And, and it's just a matter of coming out and just checking and seeing if it's if it's too hot to handle. Let it let it rest a little bit longer. Yeah. So check your air pressure on your tires. Take the valve cap off. Make sure you hold on to that. Don't lose it. Uh, even though the valve stem's got a nice little valve in it to hold the air in, there's no such thing as a perfect seal that valve stem is going to leak a little bit over time. You back the valve stem up with a cap that helps to keep the air in the tire, which is where you want it, in the tire. And then to check that, you just push it onto the valve and read the valve. The gauge says I'm at about 34 PSI, which is where I want. The button on the side releases oh, the air wow. pressure to reset. Where do you get those? Um, up the street, AutoZone. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's it's cool. like 13 bucks. And, I and get one of those. <laughs> when you're done, make sure you put that valve cap back on. Um, it tells you the PSI and everything. And one thing I've learned too is if you're going to check the pressure on all four tires, don't come and take off all four valve caps. Go check them all and that, because you're going to lose one. Been there, done that. Um, anything else? Uh, how, do, how do you know how much pressure your tires Okay, need? I'll show you right here. On the inside of the door frame, on the driver's side, there's a nice little sticker. Uh, it's kind of partly worn off, but you can tell that it said 30 okay. PSI. <laughs> so that's where I want to be at. With it. According to the manufacturer, I want to be at 30 PSI. For this specific For vehicle. this specific vehicle. Okay. These tires are a, a different tire than what it came with. Mm -hmm. And that they recommended a 32, so that I usually run at about 32. Okay. And again, you can look at your at the wear on the wear pattern on your tires to tell you if you're running either too high or too low. Where on the tire Which, would you find the number so you could identify like what kind of tire you uh, usually they're right around here. Yeah. Do -do 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 right there. So this one is M and S, which means mud and snow. Uh, 225 60R 17. The 17 is the rim size, so that's the 17 inches across here. Uh, 60R refers to the the height of the tire itself. The R means it's a radial tire, which is everybody. That's about all you can get nowadays. Hey, this is a radial, radial right? tire. I got it. And then the 225 is the width of the tire. Okay, so. Um, uh, let me get this straight. Sure, sure. M&S, mud and snow. Right. 17 is uh, the rim. Wheel size. The wheel size, yep. yes. Uh, 6-0-I is the height. The height of the tire, right there. And 225 is the width of the tire. Width. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Any questions about that? Or anything else? Okay. All right. Bad, bad. Well, in that I case, see you. I'm trying to get to that. <laughs> yeah, we did pretty good. Today. All right. Thank Thanks you, everybody Jeff. for joining. Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, we're gonna to make things go a little bit quicker and easier with the video piece. We're gonna actually do a second. Um, I'm gonna pull a tire off. Show you how to change tire. Oh, can I help? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
Uh, if you don't know how to do it or if you think you know how to do it but you're not sure, stick around.